Decorating Pages is a podcast dedicated to taking you behind the scenes of the designs of your favorite TV shows and films. Each episode, I'll be sharing design stories from some of Hollywood's most famous sets, interviews from set decorators, production designers, directors, and actors about creating the look of TV and film, about their design inspirations, and stories that take sets from page to screen. Hello there, and welcome to Decorating Pages. I'm your host, Kim Wanup. How are ya? Hope you had a good holiday of Easter, Passover, spring break with the kids. Hope you survived. I get it. Um, Yeah, I went away. I went uh, back east, Philly, South Jersey, and met new cousins, new babies. Uh, Had a wonderful holiday. Threw my mom a surprise party. It was great. Had a really great time, and I'm back. And double prizes, both of my American Airlines flights had Wi-Fi working, which hasn't happened in a long time, I would say. So I actually got to watch something while my kids watched all their stuff. But um, I hit the Fablemans finally, which I know I've seen really bits and pieces, and I've seen... You know, Rick Carter's work and Karen O'Hara's work, and I think it's phenomenally done. Just the style of it and every nook and cranny of that is so lived in and um, so layered and aged, and the palette is great. It's just a beautiful film. I didn't really like it, to be honest. I don't really like Michelle Williams, and I don't really like Paul Dano. I think Paul Dano's best performance was Little Miss Sunshine when he was quiet through most of the movie. I don't know. Well, no, he was actually really good in There Will Be Blood. I gotta give him that. Not a big fan of him. And he's so, like, restrained and I understand he's playing someone. I think I just wanted more film excitement. Spielberg being a kid in films. And I know how many times can we watch a kid make a, make a film, but um... I don't know, carry it into college. I don't know. And the whole thing with the mom, I just wasn't, ugh, I just wasn't into it. <laughs> so, and I know a couple of my friends really like that movie and I feel bad, but no. Nah. Um, I got to see a little bit of A Man Called Otto, um, production designed by Barbara Ling and three decorators, Jessica Anderson, uh, Frank Galen, and Michael Amato. I only got to see about a half hour, 45 minutes of it, and I think I'd continue on. I don't know. Did anybody see that? Is it worth it? I don't know. I haven't heard a peep about that movie, so, but it kind of interests me, and Tom Hanks being a cranky old man is kind of fun. It's laid, you know, it's not too heavy, although a little bit of the subject was heavy, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sure all anyone can talk about right now is the session, and, um... Oof. That third episode was extraordinary. I just think extraordinary writing and directing and the camera work of how you follow these people and these actors really portraying finding out that your your father has been has died. It's just fantastic. It was fantastic. Um, I'm doing, I'm recording this before Sunday, so I don't, I guess I should wait to talk about episode four, but I'm sure it's going to be great anyway, but I don't feel like anyone was super surprised that he died. I mean, the show is called Secession. We all knew it was going to happen, right? Um, I think we all thought maybe first season, um, and that awful episode when he was in the hospital, the most boring hour ever, but, um. No, it's so good. Secession is so good, and the helicopters and the yacht, and like, uh, it's so good. We actually talk a little bit about it in this uh, this interview, but um, just loved it. I love Secession. I'm watching Perry Mason. I think it's better than the first season. Production designer Keith Cunningham and set decorator Helena Swalve. I just think it's, I think the story's better. 
I think Matthew Reese has lightened up a little and um that's his name right Matthew Reese shit um yeah I do I like Perry Mason and this past week or so uh the marvelous Miss Maisel is on Amazon in its final fifth season with production designer Bill Groom and set decorator Ellen Christensen Oof, uh, it's just perfect. Everything about that design of that show is just perfect. I love it. I just want to eat it up and just I'm dazzled by it every time. And the costumes and the hair and the makeup, like, those are all my favorites. And I'll tell you, and I've said this before, I'm not a big fan of the of Miss Maisel because I feel like her dialogue is like, but up, 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 like that whole singy songy way. I just can't stand it. But I was never a fan of Monk. And Tony Shalhoub is so funny to me in this show that I laugh out loud at least once every episode because of one of his lines. I just think he, the, his delivery and everything is, is so good. Um, their first episode, they're in the TWA terminal. Um, uh, in uh, New York and they make that look amazing even though it is already um, in the second episode they unveil these um, like a late night show office comedy offices and uh, like almost like a production office really and I thought those were done fantastic it's kind of like a more r- lighter brighter Mad Men type of office which is nice Um, I don't understand they do this like they do this flash forwards now they're trying to tell you the end of the story where she ends up and everything during the episodes so she they had her on the 60 minute interview and I cannot for the life of me understand why it's in like some shipping yard I don't know maybe they'll reveal that later but it's completely odd to me so um and then as they go on they do Israel and So there's a whole storyline how, like, she's kind of a bad mother, which I have been saying since, like, the very beginning and what a horrible mother she is. So I'm glad that they're acknowledging that in the (laughs) storyline and making light of it, at least a little, because she's a horrible mother. Anyway, I I think it's going to be a good farewell season. So I'm excited. I'm three episodes in. I think they released the first three all at once. So dive into that if you can. I'm really enjoying that one. On this episode, I'm talking to Dean Devlin and Jonathan Glasner, who are the creators of the sci-fi network show, The Ark. It's a drama that explores a post-apocalyptic world in space. Devlin is an accomplished filmmaker with experience producing movies like Independence Day, Godzilla, and while Glasner has produced and written for popular sci-fi shows like Stargate SG-1 and The Outer Limits together... They bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise into the arc, creating an immersive space traveling world with compelling characters and intricate plot lines. Um, this show has garnered a dedicated following for its imaginative storytelling and stunning visuals, making it a must watch for all sci fi fans. Um, It was an absolute pleasure to speak with them, and I am glad I got to tell them that their influence on me and other people in sci-fi, I'm just kind of in awe of that. And um, well done job to uh, the production designer, Randall Groves, who I have worked with and didn't realize when I um, got the invitation to talk to these two that um, Randall had done this series, and I, having just done sci-fi or, or uh, no, I guess it's not sci-fi for all mankind isn't sci-fi but for having done done space um I really appreciate his designs and I think it was just really well done uh design wise and um so the finale is on this week so check that out. So then you can binge it all on Peacock. It's a sci-fi channel. It's a sci-fi network show, but you can binge it on Peacock if you want. And um, I find out in this interview that they were just picked up for season two. So bravo and congratulations. So I hope you enjoy. That's all that matters. <laughs> that's, 
that's more than that. No, I can't. <laughs> Usually I have some sort of audio issue, so Ace is already. <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I know I know all of our time gets a little crunched up, so thank you so much for for uh, getting this together. I really appreciate it. How are you? Good. good. How are you? We're in a good mood today. Oh, good. Well, there you go. I just discovered I know uh, Randall Groves. I know you do. I do. I did a. Uh, I did uh, the player with him, like some part of a pilot years ago, and, and I have kept in touch with him because he is a gem. He is a very, very special human being. Yeah. I try to use him on everything. Yeah, <laughs> he's a gem. He's such a kind person, and and just I think coming too from construction, he has such a knowledge of what's possible and what. Uh, what materials to use and and how he can make the best of it. I, I really appreciate working with him and I've tried to work with him again. So I was so glad to see his name and I reached out to him and told him how great I thought the sets were. Just fantastic. So, yeah, he had a busy year that year because he was doing that because he set this thing up in Serbia, but then he was working with us every day in uh, New Orleans on Leverage Redemption. So he was that's what he, he was said. burning the candle on both ends. That's what he said. He was like, I have no, I had so much jet lag in doing, <laughs> in, in prepping for those sets, but uh, you know, they, they turned out fantastic. So I think, I think the look of the show was just fantastic. And the, the special effects I Thank feel you. like are really good. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of knowledge just coming off of for all mankind, what it takes to do all of that sci-fi design and everything. So it's a lot. It's a lot. It's it a is lot. a lot. I found that, um, you know, costumes and um, production and the design and the decor, there's so many questions that would come up in meetings that might not have been thought of, of like, well, how is their air system or how are they really communicating? And like, you know, so how was that on the show? Just the, like discovering how this ship really works. Well, you know, there, there's the kind of Uber from 35,000 feet idea of it, but, you know, 35,000 light years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, when you make a sci-fi show like this, it, it's literally every single thing on front of the camera has to be manufactured. So yeah. it's, what does a flashlight look like? Yeah. What does, what do shoes look like? What are, you know, it's like, there's so many things that you have to start thinking about and having discussions about that you would never have to on a normal show. Yeah. No, I, I know so many things came up and, and I feel like our showrunners would be like, that's a good question. Um, let me get back to you. Let me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's go back and think about that. And, um, you know, we'll get back to you on that. But it is, and it it's not that you guys can think of everything. And that's why other departments are there to help and create and all be in on it. So I loved it. I loved, I've always wanted to do space. So I loved it. Um, I did want to thank you guys uh, because of your creativity and history in the business of so many pieces of um, like Stargate, like so many references that we all have <laughs> because of you guys. <laughs> Because of you two, like Independence well, Day, like, you. it oh, just... I think I think it goes ahead of before us. Actually, uh, we, we were referencing a lot of the ones yeah. that we grew up on. So, <laughs> of course, <laughs> it's gone. of course. But I think that's one of the ultimate uh, like tributes is someone referencing your work, and I know that that Stargate has come up many times in conversations. Um, through the sci-fi world and 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 the design of it and everything, so I have to thank you for that. Hold on, I gotta let my dog out. I have. <laughs> I just got a puppy, and he's it's the worst idea I ever had. Um, <laughs> oh, I have too. I know how it is. Like, I like I needed they, that. They need your attention all the time. You don't leave your shoes on the floor anymore when you have puppies. No, <laughs> no. I mean, I had I've I've toddlers. I should have known better, but. <laughs> the puppy is a whole different situation, but um, how did you come about with this storyline? Because like, it has a lot of twists and turns. I mean, I'm only up to episode 10, which aired last week. So I'm like, what? <laughs> what is going on? It's a fantastic storyline. Well, well, I can take credit for, the, for the, uh, uh, the initializing it, but these great story twists and all these surprises is this man right here. I mean, and, and a room full of writers. Yeah. I can't take full credit for it. Yeah. 
I mean, how many writers do you have in the room? Uh, this year we have uh, five, including me, six, including him. Wow. That's nice. Yeah. So that's like, that's like. Wait, four and five. I'm yeah. sorry. Four, four, including me and five. Including five. Me. Well, that, so then do you have writers, all of those writers write the episodes or do you have anybody come in? Because some shows you have. No, people, it's it's just it. us. Oh, that's yeah. nice. You know, the thing is with a, a serialized show like this, it's kind of one big episode. Right. You know, so. Right. You, it, it, it's no, really hard to have freelancers write for it. Yeah. yeah. If you're not in the room the whole time and having the endless discussions about a million different aspects, it's hard to kind of bomb in and just do one episode. Yeah. Was Do you find that working and writing for streaming services is different than writing for regular network? Well, we're writing for a network. They're writing for, writing for, um, Peacock, for right? sci-fi. Oh, it's sci-fi, but it's on Peacock. It starts, right, it starts on sci-fi, and then oh. they air it on Peacock the next day. Oh, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was not, not at all, because these days, <laughs> half the people in the world only watch streaming. They don't even have right. cable. So. And, and the truth is, there, there was a, a poll done recently where uh, the majority of people who could name the show that they like to watch couldn't name where they watch it because <laughs> it's so confusing because they just DVR it or, you know, yeah. right. I have, I used to, I actually had to start making a list of what, what I'm watching, what it's on, because then I would think it was on Hulu and it's not. And I'm wasting five minutes trying to find what I wanted to watch. And I feel like I'm pretty smart about these things and I still couldn't. Or when you're, that- when you're working, like I just did a show, like they did a show. It's Sony for Apple. So the, you know, who, who's my boss here? <laughs> but I, that's why in the beginning we, we were so hoping that we would set this up at Sci-Fi Channel because we thought, well, at least that's really, um, you know, intuitive. It's right. a Sci-Fi show. It's right. on Sci-Fi Channel. It kind of makes sense. Right. It makes a lot more sense that you say that now because I was like, <laughs> this is ballsy of Peacock to put all this money and effort into, <laughs> into this Sci-Fi. <laughs> but yeah. Um, are you, are there challenges like logistically bringing this up having it being done like across halfway across the world or like were you there the whole time like what were you doing well we were back and forth i mean dean directed the pilot Mm -hmm. so he was there for sort of the setup of the whole show setting up the sets and designing them and everything and i directed the finale and so i was there for you know probably three episodes of shooting because i was prepping so we were there a lot of the time yeah. No, but not most, not all of the time. And we have a great team there who we trust, and yeah, they they mail it ninety nine point nine percent of the time. So. We had done another series there with this this same group of people, uh, and we had done uh, three seasons in Serbia with them. So we, we had a real oh. good rapport with them, and and uh, we trusted them, and they trusted us. So I mean, it, it, I think had we not had that that experience, this might have been more difficult. And you're talking oh, talking about <laughs> you're talking about some of like the key people like producers and um, not locations. The whole crew, the, the, the crew. whole post production, everything. Yeah, the guys who drove the trucks were the same guys. I mean, it was yeah. it was the whole team. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. fantastic! I noticed that you had some of the same actors as in uh, the Outpost, and that's always nice. That's always like yeah. you, you know their limits and you know their abilities, and you can write to that. It's fantastic. Yeah, although what's interesting is that they're all playing completely different characters yeah. than they played on the outpost. Yeah. And and doing it really well. You know, it's like you never know if, if an actor just because they can play X that they can play Y also. Right. These guys have been great. Yeah. I I would think as an actor having such a vast difference but having being comfortable with with the writing and, and your style and everything would help them so much. I'm sure it's very helpful to them in well, trusting. It's kind of like a rep company at some point, you know, <laughs> you all know each other so yeah. well. And uh, <laughs> it, it really does become this, I, you know, it's so overused in television, that, but you do, you become a family. Oh yeah, you do. There's no more hugging, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not, not really allowed to, uh, to hug anymore. Although some people do. I think, I think, I feel like, uh 80s they still like to get some hugs i don't know what that's about but (laughs) (laughs) it's a little different there they're they're more european so they still Um, hug i kiss on the cheek yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. two kisses yeah there you go (laughs) 
Um, can you talk anything about um, how when writing this, I wonder, do you ever fear like we're never going to be able to afford this, but you keep writing? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, we have, we've bitten off more than we should have chewed a few times then and barely made our delivery because we were doing so many visual effects. Um, and there, but there's, you know, we do write, uh, you know, thankfully I know enough about production and about post post-production and visual effects that I yeah. kind of know what we're, what we're capable of and don't write beyond that. But we've had a couple episodes that we got pretty big. Yeah. I mean, the, the Comet episode was like... Yeah. Could have had our head examined before we wrote <laughs> down, Well, funny enough, there's uh, there's a lo- there's some similarities in, in the uh, storyline to uh, For All Mankind, too. So when I was watching it, I was like, hey, that's crazy. Everyone's doing the same research here. This is, uh, this is fun. These, um, I have watched that. I've heard wonderful things about it, but I haven't seen it. I've heard it's amazing. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun for me. Uh, it was my first season, fourth season, and I, you get to jump 10 years every time. So creatively, the sets are all new. So that's nice. But you're still, you know, the, it's um, the same storyline, but new sets. And then they were on the moon and now they're on Mars. So it was fun. Oh. But yeah. I was so obsessed with all of the chairs in like in this in the ship and like i know how hard it is to have the set designer design them and have them all made and then everything on the desks and that and the lab and then the cafeteria like i get it i get all of that and making sense of it all and when we were when we were shooting the pilot um a lot of it t- takes place with them in full uh, space outfit with it, with the helmets on. Right. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to test this stuff, you know, to have it manufactured and ready in time. We literally got them off the truck and started shooting. <laughs> and in the pilot episode, the, the, the shields, the masks kept popping off in the middle of takes. Oh, no. <laughs> so luckily, you know, after that, we, we solved that issue. But it was it was so frustrating. You're, you're literally in the middle of your favorite take, and the glass just goes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that, that and the actors couldn't hear each other. We couldn't hear each other, <laughs> we yeah. To, we had to hide uh, earphones in there for them to hear each other. <laughs> well, I took one look at that helmet room, and I was like, that costs a lot of money. <laughs> like, we were, like, moving our helmets around, like, behind camera because we didn't have enough. I, I was, there's got to be like 20 helmets in that room. I was like, wow, this show had a lot of money. <laughs> Look at all those helmets. Like we didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing that you start to fake it a little bit. And then, you know, it's just believable of, of what you can get away with. And um, how, how many stages did you guys have for all of these sets and all of your. There were four stages altogether. Wow. Um, but the the dome that had the plants yeah. that was actually outside. Oh wow! Uh, because we weren't using plastic plants; we were using real plants. Mm-hmm. So in between the shoot, we had to take off the fabric covering it so that the sun could keep the plants alive. Otherwise, they would have all died. That's really smart because we had one and we had to keep taking them in and out. So <laughs> bravo, well, the truth Randall. Is, the truth is, they a lot of them died anyway. Well, it got really hot in there when we were when we were shooting. Yeah. Oh right, yeah. But, the it, the lights kill it, kill it. But um, did you af- um, after seeing the sets up? Did it make you want to write more to any particular sets? Not really, because I mean, when you're writing a show uh, set in a spaceship, you're going to spend a lot of time in the bridge. Yeah. Oh, Beautiful. the bridge better be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I would love to write a whole lot more stuff for the for the um, observation room, for example. Mm-hmm. But we didn't just because there wasn't a whole lot of story that would happen in there, you know. Yeah. Organically, so. I think the biggest influence was just when when John and I were walking on the set when it was first built, is we both became like thirteen years old. Right. <laughs> you know, you're on a spaceship and it's cool and. You know, like all the hallways, um, they had a ceilings. And you know, as you know, most sets don't have ceilings. So yeah. usually you're on a set and you're very aware you're on a set. But yeah. When you're on a set like these hallways where everywhere you look, you're seeing reality, you start to feel like you're on a spaceship. Yes. <laughs> it was really cool. Yes. 
the hallway situation in space is is a real problem. Sometimes you need more hallway, but where is it going? Can we move this hallway around and shoot it the other way? Can we have them come this direction? I, I mean, it's a lot. Because you're also thinking realistically, how much hallway do we have here? I mean, you've you got gigantic ships, but we can't build all that. But how much of the um, show is time for post? Like from ending the episode? I mean, I know that they start post like that night sometimes just to get it going. But do you have a, like a couple months? Oh, no, no. We're, 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 our plan always is six weeks of post per episode. Oh, oh, yeah. We don't always make that <laughs> because oh, some yeah. of these effects take longer. Right. Uh, but, but yeah, we are, 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 from the moment we finish shooting until we're having a, uh, an episode that's maybe not completely finished as far as color correction and final mix, but it's six weeks. It's six weeks. And then how yeah. much, I mean, writers and, and you, are on first, but how much prep time did you have before shooting? Before the whole series or each episode? The well, the whole series, like in the before the first episode. About twelve weeks. 12 yeah, weeks. something like that. 12, twelve weeks. weeks. And then, did you block shoot? Sometimes, some of the episodes are, are block shot. Some of them are are single episodes, depending on the content of the episode and if there's a guest star. Or, right. And also, if we had a director doing two episodes back to back, then it was easier to block shoot. Right. It's also, I kind of like it because then you might get a little bit more time to do a specific scene or set. You could push that to the end, and instead of it being 10 days out, it's 20 days out. And that's the always any time. We don't go out. We don't go well, you don't out. Go out. No, I mean, out, out, out of the us. schedule. But yeah, no, no, I know. We went, and we were hard, still on hard Earth. Hard on the, so. It's harder on the actors because they're shooting a scene from one episode and then, you know, five minutes later, they're shooting a scene from another episode. Right. It, it's hard for them. So. Yeah. Got its pluses and minuses. What, um, in the episode, there's, is it nine? I think the arc, they're on arc 15. And I think it's Evelyn says that she saved all these beautiful creations of man. And there's <laughs> like beautiful paintings on the wall and, and some pink flamingos and, and, rugs. Yeah. and then and then there was the neon flink, pink flamingos and i thought it's got to be a joke somewhere that someone in 100 in 100 years from now the pink flamingo is going to be remembered as one of the works of art of our time <laughs> the neon pink flamingo yeah it's it, you know remember in 100 years from now it's an antique of course of course i was thinking that's pretty that's pretty funny but it is like neon like who would you'd have to save neon who would know i mean that mm -hmm. Was there a lot of discussion of what went into like what you want to see? And especially in the bridge, you made it into like a living room and everybody's room had more personal effects and more like um, decor to them. Well, I think it's a combination of, of uh, the ideal of what we want and what can we get. <laughs> so, you right. Know, you know, you have to kind of balance it between, uh, you know, John and I are very ambitious guys. You know, we always want way more than we can do. So we start off with, okay, the entire universe explodes. And then right. it's like, okay, the glass explodes. Right. <laughs> right. And you know how it is with getting with uh, clearances on art. No, don't. So we could, you know, there, there were a lot of pieces of art we couldn't clear. Yes. So those are, you know, will that painting clear? Okay, let's get that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're tra you're talking about like uh, trying to get like a Mona Lisa or something, and you're just not. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. It's such a sad thing to me because I talk about clearance a lot on this of like how it hinders us so much sometimes. Like you just want someone you know sitting at a table playing a board game, and it has to be like ND, and it can't be life anymore. It can't be like Monopoly. It can't you know. It's just such a bummer of the clearance issues everywhere I talk about it i hate it it's tough yeah. but you see these lawsuits that are just crazy and you go well i don't want to get involved in that so no no i i was working on bones and this guy called my office once and he was like hey i uh, i um i watched the episode last night and my artwork is hanging in the diner and i was like Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold, please. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone stop what they're doing. I want to know where the paperwork is for that artwork. 
And then I was like, I'm so sorry. I rented that so you could contact these people. They have your clearance or whatever. But it was like total panic of I'm going to cost this show like thousands and thousands of dollars if you show well, we've up. Had, we've had to cover tattoos because they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're copyrighted by whoever did the tattoo. Well, you remember what happened with uh, uh, on, on uh, what was it? The, um, the Hangover with uh, oh, yeah. uh, the, Mike Tyson's Mike t- Tyson. tattoos. Like, yeah. you know, Fifteen million dollar lawsuit. Yeah, graffiti. Like if we shoot out, you know, you're shooting in downtown LA. You got to cover up all that graffiti. God forbid someone who tagged there is gonna like get a lawyer, lawyer up, and get some dough out of it. It's it's insane. Which is nice in space. You don't really have to think about that, which is nice. <laughs> Until you put artwork in. <laughs> you put artwork. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was nice about it. And I I think in the beginning too of, of doing streaming, there was less like Netflix didn't care as much and now they do. It's kind of a bummer. I don't know. But anyway. Well, you don't usually care until you've been sued a couple times. And then yeah. you start caring a lot. <laughs> you until your name gets brought up in that lawsuit and then you're like, I'll never do that again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with commercial with commercial supported television, that's why Netflix didn't care as much as right. you know. You don't want to have a Pepsi can on there if Coke turns out to be your sponsor, right? Right. So because Pepsi's sh- not going to sue you for having the can there, but no. you got to worry about products. I, I did. I did work with some producers who had a, a logic of like, let's just do it and pay for it later. Like, let's just let's not ask for permission because if they say no, then you're screwed. But if you just do it and show it in a good light, and then I'm pretty sure that those producers didn't own the show. No, <laughs> <laughs> true, true. They were <laughs> maybe they were gambling, problem. but I'm on another show next season. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's true. That's, if that's, they, Fox, that's 20th Century Fox's problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's so true. Um, what? Um, let me see. Can you talk about the balance of sci-fi elements? versus the human drama in the show like how you interact all the storyline well for me for me it's human human drama first mm-hmm. science so for me the science fiction is almost a um an arena to play the human drama in mm-hmm. it's not it shouldn't be the forefront of it it's i mean we come up with some really cool sci-fi ideas but it's all always with an eye to how will our characters react to that right you know what will what would be the most impactful for Garnett? You know, this or this, and we go we do it that way. Yeah, there's such a element too of loneliness. I find when you do space um, storylines, because there's such a you're the only one here, or we're the only ones around. And I always find that in good storytelling with space uh, themes. It's so essential to grab onto that. Like we have to band together to stay alive, or we have to do this to keep to keep you safe and everything. And I find that really well done in the series. Well, that was a big part of how we designed the the spaceship because, mm-hmm. you know, we wanted a show that was about a group of, of very different people who are forced together in a contained space that's a pressure cooker, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, we also knew we were going to be on the spaceship for the entire series. So we didn't want it to become Das Boot. We didn't want to become overly claustrophobic. So we had to design some areas where you felt claustrophobic. But then, as uh, John was just saying, the observation deck, we wanted to open it up. Or in the dome, we wanted to have something more organic so that we could do maybe a romantic walk or just a different feeling. So a lot of the choices of what we decided to put into the ship was based on thinking ahead of, all right, if I'm eight episodes into this, you know, am I going stir crazy or is there enough visual uh, uh, differences that uh, that I don't feel uh, uh, claustrophobic? Yeah. And and to the viewer, too, you you see that how the relationship of where they are and what the scene is, whether it's a fight scene or an intimate scene. You got to, the, the surroundings have to lend to that too. So it does, it does help to have some difference. I think, especially that greenhouse being so open, but so alive, there's such life right. in there and such hope that, that, that's mm-hmm. such a, it's such a good, um, it's such a good set, really. I really like that one. And yet it's, it's a set that 
in the context of the story was never supposed to be what it is. It was right. supposed to just carry cargo and then that was going to be jettisoned onto the planet. And it was the creativity of the survivors on the ship who came up with the idea of turning it into a farm, right. you know, and I think yeah. that is the hope of our show. It, you know, the, the, the hope is, are these people going to rise to this occasion and meet the moment and survive? But they, to do that, they have to become the best versions of themselves. Yeah. I do. I like the characters too, that, they're all different like the ethnicities and they're coming from the world is being destroyed and we and we're all together now we're not american we're not soviet we're not anything like that and that i feel like that came through to a lot of like we're just we're people trying to survive and i really like that aspect of the story yeah, yeah. the advantage of shooting in europe is we could actually use people with different accents and mm. different ethnicities yeah it's uh and and mystery i think there's just that one flashback to Earth, but with the bar fight, right? Or is she at a station? I forget. No, she... there, there's uh, one other one, or a series of other ones that take place outside of Trust Industries. Oh, right, 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 right. Yes. Yeah. But we never wanted this to become like Lost, where there's a whole parallel flashback story. We, we want to be yeah. on the ship with these people, but we've there was a few times where we felt like, okay, there's some things we have to explain. We've got to jump back and onto Earth just to make the story clearer. Yeah. But we wanted to be very uh, uh, judicious of when we did that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any good, um, like, behind the scenes or, like, anecdotes, funny stories of, like, like besides that mask falling off? That was pretty fun. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, the to, to be outside of Trust Industries, for instance, this was a thing where we knew we wanted to do that. But the idea of trying to do a shoot outside of the stages on this show was almost like impossible. And there was actually a facade left over from a mini series that was shot in the, uh, <laughs> and so I showed it to John. I said, John, do you think this kid? And he's like, yeah, we could do it. With this. <laughs> and so that, so we literally was directly across the street from our sound stage. Yeah, oh, that's really fantastic. Slapped some paint on it and put a green screen to, <laughs> for the other side of the car window. And uh, there we go. There we were. Well, that's what I was thinking. Well, they don't really need location managers. Like, that's the thing. <laughs> we save on that. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with the premise of this show? Um, it started with a lunch I had with a man named Michael Wright, who used to run TNT when I did the Leverage and the Librarians there. Um, and we were just reminiscing about the type of of science fiction shows that we really loved. And Mike was saying, you know, I, I would so love to see another show about a group of people, you know, all, all confined on a, on a spaceship going to some destination, you know, with a hope of a new beginning. And, and, and then we just started reminiscing about all the shows that made us want to make television. And after that meeting, I kept thinking, yeah, I've always wanted to do a space show, but if I were going to do one, what would be, what would be the take that would make it different? You know, why would why should you watch this one if you've already seen all the others? And that's when this idea came about of, okay, but what if the people on the ship are not the people who are meant to run the ship? That of all the people that were meant to run the ship, all the teachers, all the engineers, all the scientists, what if they were all killed in a terrible accident in the first scene? And now everybody who's left has to step into these roles that they weren't really prepared for. And that became really kind of exciting. And when I pitched that to John, that's what he he jumped on. And then we just started rolling with that. Oh, man. The, the element of you're not really supposed to be do you. You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> like, you didn't really have this much responsibility. And now you're in charge. It's terrifying. <laughs> and like, you know, flying a ship through space. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is thrown at you that first episode. It it really is. It's such a setup of what are these people in for. It's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, there's this moment in the pilot where they're trying to debug the system to figure out what why the air is being lost, and Garnett yells at Bryce, and Bryce is like, "I'm a navigation guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is not my area. I have no idea how to run this thing." Yeah, and that's really kind of the whole show. Yeah. Um, but they're educated people. They're talented people. They were meant to one day become this. Yeah. But, you know, it's like I, I can play tennis. And when I'm playing with some friends, I, I can play okay. But if you threw me into, you know, uh, yeah. Wimbledon, <laughs> Wimbledon <laughs> yeah. no matter what I know, it would be worthless. You know, uh, yeah, the, so these people, they're not dummies, but they're also not prepared. And, and not just intellectually, but emotionally. Because, you know, the pressure of the situation. 
you know, uh, uh, there's so many times you'll watch the episode and well, why didn't they think of this? It's like, because they're, they can't even believe they're in that chair is why they didn't think of this or right. that, you know. And that's, the, that's I think, the, the, the Achilles heel of these characters, which, which makes it scary to watch their adventure. But as they come up with their solutions, that's also what makes it hopeful and uplifting. Oh, and and I really like that it's like time goes by, like what you like. It's not just like oh, this is a week of their life. This is like time going by trying to figure out this problem. It's not, you know, having the the doctor have an addiction problem in the middle of all of this is <laughs> very like that. That probably happens. The stress probably gets to a lot of people, and that probably happens. So, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, on a lot of these. Uh, serialized shows on streamers, it's a very slow peeling of the end. You know, mm. it's a very slow rollout of the plot and the story. And John and I made a very conscious effort to do the exact opposite on this. Thank we wanted you. every episode to be so filled with twists and turns and energy that, you know, you're exhausted after each episode. Yeah. No, and thank you for that. Through. Yeah. Thank you for that. Because there is sometimes <laughs> it's, there are some shows I get, I don't know. I don't know my attention span isn't as long as it used to be or something. I don't know. I stayed with ER for 14 years or whatever. And now I get like two episodes into some. I'm like, I'm, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> so it, it definitely it's keeps, yeah, it definitely, this show definitely keeps moving, which is nice. And problems get solved and problems occur and problems get solved. Is it 12 episodes or te- it's 12? 12. But tonight is the penultimate episode, and next week is the finale. I know. I thought it was 10. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, good. I'll have seen the finale when I talk to you. And now I'm super <laughs> bummed that I don't get to talk to you about it. So well, I'll you have to invite us back. <laughs> I know. I'll be watching. I want to try to get Randall to, to talk and, and then have this, you know, kind of split together just so he can talk about it. And maybe after the finale, I'll get to get to chat with him about it you should yeah how do you see i know this is a big question but i thought since i had two of you here do you how do you see science fiction the genre evolving like in our future because we're i mean we're we're not where we are with the jets the jetsons had us way up like advance of where we should be now but with like what you can do digitally and how you can write and how you can write these big arcs of shows and everything. How do you see like sci-fi evolving with that? Well, what's interesting is a lot of what was science fiction has become science fact now. And it, it's getting, so it's getting, I guess it's probably what's always been true with science fiction. If you go back and look at like 1950s science fiction, they were predicting things that would be happening in 2000 and it happened probably sooner than 2000 and I'm sure that what we're saying what we're writing is going to be dated and you know but and, I still want my flying cars yes I still want flying cars and I want my flying car <laughs> I mean it's moving things are moving so fast now that we you know when we um started our our mission to Proxima B while we were shooting the web telescope found more planets that are closer yeah so we're like yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. What are you gonna what are you gonna do? Yeah. No, the um, the James Webb telescope is like amazing. And I'm I feel so lucky only just getting into this like cipher. I'm I follow every astronaut, I follow all this I follow all these Mars, you know, I, I'm so into it now. I just love that it's all there and accessible to us. And I feel like that must be so inspiring as as sci fi writers. It, it is, but it also makes it challenging. Yeah. Just like, yeah, you know, I, I wanted to write a story maybe where the computer becomes intelligent and, I'm, and then chat GPT comes out and I'm like, <laughs> well, well, that's dated. That won't work anymore. <laughs> you know? Right. But I think the real fun of science fiction is not really the science. Right. It's to take, oh, right. It's to take the issues that are difficult to talk about today over your dinner table at Thanksgiving and to put it into a context where suddenly you can have that conversation with people right. because it's more theoretical. It's more about the ideas as opposed to the specifics, which makes things very difficult to talk about. You know, uh, my mother was a guest star on the very original Star Trek. 
So I was watching that as a child. And, you know, when I look back at it now, I start, I realized every episode was either about the Vietnam War or it was about race relations. Yeah. But I didn't realize it at the time. It was just a cool sci-fi show. But or it, Tribbles. Tribbles. Okay. Yeah. Well, that guy, I heard the story about the guy just making that up. I don't know. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> we, um, I'm on the, uh, I'm a governor in my peer group at the committee. And I'm also on the, um, we're making up 75 most impactful moments of television for the last 75 years because it's the Academy's 75th anniversary. And one, you know, in my group, we're trying to think of sets that, you know, influenced and everything. And one that keeps popping up is like, well, it's Star Trek or, you know, any of this. You have to bring on that sci-fi element. Like what what influenced that? And you're like, well, Star, I mean, Deep Space Nine. Like you think about all of these great sets that like influence from sci-fi. So we're definitely trying to get those in there because it's it's impactful. That Those sets are impactful and they've been copied and copied and copied. So... Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how did you guys start out? <laughs> How'd you get into this? You go well, first. I'm, I'm the son of a movie producer and, uh, and an actress. Right. So I grew up on movie sets. So, right. you know, when my friends wanted to be cowboys or astronauts or firemen, I just wanted to make movies. So right. that's kind of just been my whole life. You're into it. And I, I well, like him, I started out as an actor. Mm -hmm. was terrible. He was good. I was terrible. <laughs> so I quickly moved behind the camera and um, studied that in, in film school and just kept pursuing it until I eventually sold my first script and kept going that way. I could never be a writer. It's hard enough just to write these questions that they don't sound stupid. I can't even like... <laughs> I have such... Uh... Writing is like being in space. It's a lonely job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I... I think, too, with writers, like, you know, you sit around that production table and they hand out the scripts and then everyone just dives in and, like, kind of tears it apart in a good way of, like, well, what does what does this mean to costumes? What does this mean to me? And, right. you know, when you're writing the stories, you know, I know that you're thinking about these things, but you're not really <laughs> you're thinking about maybe the acting the directing how is the scene going to take place and what is it leading to and what is in my storytelling so i always think it's hard when we sit around the table and we're kind of like what why does she get a raincoat or like why why is she sitting but you know i think those are the discussions <laughs> though that really help you because so often as a writer you'll write something and in your mind it makes complete and perfect sense <laughs> and then you'll get to the table and people go well, wait a minute why is it and in your ability to defend what you're doing you start to see it more clearly yeah and or you realize that you need to change it exactly <laughs> because you can't defend it yeah you know and so i think that process is enormously helpful i do and, I do too. and you're right i mean I, I in the beginning it's what's the most important thing for the character what's the most important thing for the plot what's the most important thing for the emotional resonance of the story but then the practical realities start to show up it's like okay well i can't do the thing i wanted what can i do that still has that emotional resonance and then suddenly your costume person says well what if we went a totally different way and did this and you go, oh that's actually a better idea than what i thought you know and yeah so that evolution that that you know, it, it's a cliche that uh, uh, filmmaking is a collaborative business, but it, it is. And that's what makes it great, I think. I, I can't agree more. I think we're all spokes in the wheel. I think, I mean, even grips, you got to give them some props. They can't, can't not have a grip. Well, like uh, Very much so. on our show, you know, when we were originally uh, uh, talking about the spacesuits, obviously, you know, our head goes to the NASA bulky, big giant thing. And it was our brilliant costume de designer, Ivana, who, called us up and said, have you seen what they're working on at MIT? And she showed us these, these things that are constriction suits that are supposed to be lighter and more flexible. And, and she goes, well, I was thinking of doing a variation of this. And it, then it, it not only did we like what she was doing visually, but it changed how we wrote it. Yeah. That's the thing, too. Like, when we do our homework, it helps you in, in a sense of writing and story and everything, too, because... You can't do it all. I can't do it all. I have I have people in my department also who come up and look at this. Look at this plant holder I found that hangs or whatever it is. Like, and costumes. I know that like they went through many variations and everything about like 
what is it going to be and you know getting away from the bulkiness and they're at a point now where it's not as sci-fi because they're only in 2010 the tens or 2004 sorry so they're not up to like cool shit (laughs) they're still in like a base of reality so they have to limit themselves a little bit which is a bummer because i can't wait to see this shit i don't want to work i can't I, I can't wait to see, you know, season seven, but it's going to be really hard. <laughs> but, but no, well, I would I love to do thing, it. Though, is also deciding design versus the reality of the world you're trying to create. Yeah. You know, one of the things like early on, we started to have very, very much sci-fi looking designs presented. And Jonathan and I talked about it and we said, you know, in the reality of our show, which is only 100 years from now. They're on spaceships because Earth is about to die, mm. which meant that they knew that probably 20, 30 years earlier. I so, hope so when you know the Earth is about to die, you're not really designing the next cool iPhone. You know, you're not designing, you know, all, all ingenuity goes to can we save the planet or can we get off the planet? And so things that where we spend a lot of attention on now, fashion or things like that, would fall to the wayside when there's this yeah worldwide fire that has to either be put out or you've got to get out so when we were making choices we kept thinking well would would the energy have gone there if it weren't for something other than a practical reason would they would would energy go there just for design work and and we leaned against it so there was some design work but we really tried to make it more about where they put their focus and what their particular uh uh priorities were right well, to yeah, yeah, because you gotta live. You're, I mean, you're striving to. If you're leaving yeah. your planet, your 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 goal is to live. <laughs> so. Well, but also we, we, you know, like when we think of of space travel today or air travel in general, we're thinking about a very highly regulated industry. You know, where you can't build something unless NASA approves it or the government. Approves it. But in the reality of our show, we thought, okay, this is a hundred years later from today, where all of space travel is controlled by billionaires. So all the choices are done by the billionaires and their sense of priority, not by any regulations or any government telling them what they can or cannot do. So in one regard, there'll be enormous innovation in areas that that might get suppressed, but in other areas where it would be so simple to just protect someone, the billionaire might not have thought it was important or didn't want to spend the money on it. Right. Well, it's so so funny you say that because I I rewatched Stargate yesterday and I was like, Wait a minute. These archaeologists found the stuff and then the government just took over? <laughs> they just took, you can't work on that anymore. You can't say that. You can't, he's not top secret. He doesn't have clearance. I was like, that's real bullshit. No wonder Elon Musk does his own shit now. Like, that's like, wow, we did yeah, all this they, work they, finding this and you can't It's in. the pluses and minus, yeah. you know? Yeah. You having, know, like on our ship, they, they, can, they can go across the galaxy and travel farther than anyone else in history. But they also don't have simple alarms when a door bursts open. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it wasn't something that this billionaire thought was important. So yeah, yeah, it's it is a give and take. <laughs> I don't know which I don't know which ship I'd feel safer. <laughs> <laughs> um, God, I wish you could tell me the ending. Oh, I can tell you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Ending. No, no, no. I want to really watch good. it. No, no, no. I want to watch it. I want to watch it. The I'm ending just... is really good. I, I'm I, sure I, it is. I wrote it. He directed it. I didn't write it. <laughs> oh, JP's a wonderful writer. Well, there you uh, go. But I'll tell you this. I had seen, but because we're working on the show with, through editing and effects, I'd seen the episode, I don't know, maybe 10 times. Right. <laughs> and... Just, you know, a, a little over a week ago, I finally saw the final, final version with the final music, the final effects. And it hit me like a like a punch in the gut. It was Ugh. so much more powerful than it had been up till every stage until then. And I immediately called him up and cursed him out for being a better director than me. Oh, <laughs> well, that's... It was, it's really good. I'm really proud of the finale. I, I think you're going to get a big kick out of it. And I think there'll be some good surprises in it. Oh, good. That must be such a fulfilling uh, feeling too because you're from concept to the final episode of the season having all all the layers on top of it it's got to be so well, exciting you know am i i'm i'm such a, a cynical guy i don't know if it's cynical is the right word but i it's not relieving for me because then i'm like 
Okay, so we set that up. Now what are we going to do next season? <laughs> right. I mean, that worked really well, but it kind of wrote us into a corner. Now what are we going to do? Which is what you want to do, but it's still... Now, you want to you... point where the audience is wondering what we're going to do next. But... Are you picked up for a second season? As of 15 minutes ago, it was just announced. Really? Done. Congratulations. <laughs> well, then you better get to work. You got to... <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations. I know, I know what a, to not know is always like, ugh, oh, ugh, just, t- just tell me yes or no. Like, are we coming back or do I to clean up my office or not? Like, <laughs> I used to. It was to- a very happy, it was a very happy celebration for us and with the actors. They, they, they were so excited to get back in space again. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that as a viewer. I'm really happy that I'll, <laughs> I'll get to continue on with them. Um, let me see. Mm, do you have a favorite aspect of working on the show? Is it is it delivering the script? Is it directing? Is it? Mm. You know, it's all fun for me. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It really is. I'd say I love seeing. I love seeing what the actors are going to do with what we've written because mm-hmm. they always do something a little different than you'd expect. Because they're good actors. Yeah. Um, I love, you know, I love working on the visual effects. Yeah. Yeah. It's stressful sometimes because we're in such a hurry, but um, I love seeing when, you know, when they send us that shot and it's like, wow, that's what we imagined. <laughs> and that's so cool. That's always fun. I think for me, my favorite part is when we're, we're here at our office in the screening room watching, you know, pretty close to a final version of, of an episode mm-hmm. and just feeling like, wow. We did it. We liked that show. <laughs> I wrote that sentence and somebody said it and somebody did it and somebody lit it and somebody designed. That's fantastic. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it again, we were talking about this earlier, but it's like the first time you walk on a set of something that you had imagined, it's like walking into a dream that became real. Yeah. You know, because you dreamt something and you dreamt it was going to look a certain way. And suddenly you walk in there and it's like, this looks even better than my dream. Well, that's always you know, good. It's a very exciting feeling. Have you have you ever walked into a set and said no? Lots of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it's John and I going, all right, what do we do? How do we, how yeah. do we put some stuff on the wall? Uh, can we do some harsher lighting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't always yeah. work out. <laughs> well, there, there's, there's how much time you have. There's how much money you have. Yeah. There's... You know, when something didn't work out or the the contract materials didn't show up and now you're trying to do something on the fly or, you oh, know, yeah. sometimes like um, we had had this original idea on how the sleeping pods in the pilot were going to open. And we thought for sure it's going to be great. And then the first day we went to do it and it was going tick, 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 tick. <laughs> like, all right, put some fishing wire on it. And we're going to pull it like this. So, you know. How, best laid plans often lead astray. I was actually going to ask about that. How many were there? Was there 16. like 16 and then that was, and then they, and then they, yeah. 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 Those were great. Those are cool, right? Yeah. Didn't look Fun. creaky at all. It looked fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed that. And I also enjoyed that. I feel like you kind of know like, oh, they're on the different ships, but you guys are using the same ship and you're just, you know, the walls are a little different or whatever. They're the same. And then, you know, but I also feel, felt like with the episode when they go and they find all those dead people it did had a different feeling i felt like the lighting was was done really well to capture that this is a different ship this is a different situation shit's gone wrong here so i our did director photog- our director of photography igor Suntor, came up with a whole new lighting yeah plan at that and it really helped really made it work yeah, he's a very special guy yeah, there's just enough atmosphere. He, there's, you know, the the shadows are really good and, and intense in those scenes. Like I, I felt like it, it didn't. I didn't feel like I was on the same ship, which is good. Well it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I also felt like the design with all the lighting wasn't um, like a Star Wars replica. You know, it's hard to get away from that. Let's be honest. Everything you want to design gets away from it. I thought it the in, integrating all those light panels and everything looked really well, and people were well lit. It's very hard to to on one hand make it familiar enough that people know what it is, mm-hmm. and yet make it original enough that it doesn't feel like you've seen it 
a million times. I mean, one of the things that I was fighting for very early on in the design was this idea that the air tanks would actually be part of the helmet. Mm. And we made, went through like 30 different designs before we got one that we, we fell in love with. But the early designs was like, what are we doing? Just put it on the back, make it like everybody else. But when we got it, we felt like, okay, you, you can look at it, you can pretty much guess what that is. And it made sense. And it made sense for our story that they needed the helmets for air. Right. I, Excuse me. <laughs> I, I did like, I mean, I think those helmets are really, they're really good because there's, yeah. there's enough that you're seeing the actor and, and it still looks functional. I thought that they were really well yeah. done. Yeah. And, and I was, our costume designer really was uh, in charge of that. I mean, normally that would be, you know, under production, but she, she took it on and like I said, we did many designs until we got it. But when she, when she nailed it, we were jumping up and down. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> I bet. Boys, now we have three weeks, to, three weeks to manufacture them all. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm, I'm sure she was really glad when you said yes, because now we got a race to get them done. <laughs> I know they, well, they, they, like they. You have to manufacture everything. You can't just yeah. go to the sci-fi store and pick up cool sci-fi props. You know, it's like every single everything. thing has to be made. Yeah. And designed. Chairs. I had many chairs made and tables. And <laughs> no, I, I, I even I ripped off some like ikea designs but then we still had them made you know so they sure. would be intricate into our our world yeah you um, start with a base of something that you can buy and then you have to augment it yeah i i love it though i think it it really pushes us all to you know design and think about function and form and you know you can't just have something hanging out and and it's hard too because then there's like dead space <laughs> and you don't usually want that, but people only bring up a backpack. Like, what else are you going to put there? Like, so, right. yeah. No, I thought the design and the palette and everything and, and very well lit. I, again, I thought it was done really well. Um, is there anything, Dean, that you... Do you have any sort of, like, Easter eggs that you put into your shows from other project all the time you do all all the time and that's one of the and, and you know there's a really great little community that has popped up around the arc and some of my other shows mm -hmm. and they're like detectives for those easter eggs uh, <laughs> and when I find them it's great you know on, on this one this was not an easter egg i made but the, the, from jonathan but the, the name of the clampkins disease you know <laughs> uh, so many people were like dying to know where did that name come from <laughs> We were th that season we had to write on Zoom because uh, of COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, how right on the bottom of the screen, like we have right here, are the names. And one of our writers' name was Kendall Lampkin. And it always came up as Kay Lampkin. And then <laughs> at the joke, I started calling him Clampkin. I said, Hey, Clampkin, what do you do? And then when we needed a name for the disease, I said, Do you mind if we call it that? <laughs> See that? That's creativity right in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> you just grab it and go. <laughs> um, do you think that the arc can spit off into like just arc 15 show and just like, <laughs> because you, because Stargate has so many elements to it now in how many years and how many, I mean, the series went like 10 seasons, right? I mean, it's huge. It's it, the longevity of the storylines are amazing. Well, that's again, that's the fun of genre entertainment is you can create a universe in which your concept exists in. And then not only does that spur stories for that show, but it also spurs stories for other shows, yeah. you know, it, where it feels organic. Yeah. I mean, that's why the, the Marvel universes work and the, the, the Star Wars universes work is there's so many different, different aspects of that fantasy that you'd love to see from different angles, yeah. different perspectives. Yeah. Are you watching anything right now that you uh, you love and adore and, and is it inspiring? Picard for me would yeah. be the sci-fi show right now. The card? Picard season three. Season three is amazing. Oh wow! Oh, yeah, and Succession. Yeah. The episode was probably the best hour of television I think I've ever seen. And The Last of Us. Yeah. I, I like that too. So but yeah, the same prices. Secession, let me just say, don't you think we all knew he was going to go because it's called Secession? <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of just thought. Yeah, I just didn't think he was going to take this many seasons. I wasn't yeah. surprised if, if 
go, but but I thought the way they did it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I you know I said to the writers in the writers room, I said a hack like me would have written. They're at a board table, and he goes, ah, you know. <laughs> And they didn't even show him die. They didn't even show him on camera. You know, I know. Until the very end. And it was all from the perspective of the kids. It was just amazing. And then didn't you kind of, I kind of thought, it's not real. He just wants to hear how that they too. feel. That too. Yeah. No, it was really well done. It's, yeah. a, it's a brilliantly made show. Yeah. The style of it is fantastic. I can't, it's a, a dream about it. I'd like to have that budget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think they have Believe one. Me. If you're impressed with that spaceship map, give, give me the budget of succession. I'll I, give you the greatest spaceship you ever saw. I'll tell you what, I don't think they have one. I think they just do what they want and get it get it going. I think it's fantastic. I think super yachts, helicopters. Yeah, it's crazy. Shoot all over the world. Uh, is there anything you in all of TV history that you wish you worked on? That you wish you could have written oh for me it's doctor who doctor who <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that's the show i wish i had i wish i came up with it yeah i wish it would go i freaking love that show <laughs> yeah well i i became a writer largely from watching the writing on saint elsewhere mm. which was probably before your time no no not really <laughs> <laughs> um that was the first time first television series i saw that i thought that's poetry. I mean, that's real writing. That's not just, you know, the guy pulls a gun and shoots yeah. the bad guy. It was heavy stuff and really interesting. And and I really wanted to write on that show. And right when I got out of college, but it was gone by the time I got out of college. That and Hill Street Blues felt like it was dirty or something. Like when you mm -hmm. watched it, it was like, oh, this isn't pretty and like glossy, like Dallas or whatever. It was, it was like, gritty. yeah, it was gritty. And then, and then you get the NYPD blue and then you, you know. died. They didn't actually, they didn't cure everybody there was, yeah. you know, they never came in there. People had arguments and had problems. They weren't all perfect doctors. They screwed up. You know, it was, yeah. I was actually a gang member on the uh, Hill Street Blues. Were you really? <laughs> Oh my God. Can't you tell? Doesn't he look like a gang member? That's fantastic. <laughs> that should be number one on your IMDb. Forget that Independence <laughs> Day. <laughs> um, well, I was going to ask, do you have anything coming up? But I guess you're going to start writing season two. Yep. <laughs> That's fun. Oh, this is what I want to ask you. So are you in Serbia? <laughs> like, Where are you? Are you in L.A.? Yeah. You're in L.A. Right over in L.A. Um, and then, uh, you know, a few weeks before, we'll head off to Serbia and set up the new season. That's fantastic. And then how long do you think you'll be there? Well, we commute. We don't stay there. Yeah, you don't stay. The, the show will shoot for, what, five months? Yeah, about five months. Wow. That's so yeah. exciting. <laughs> so exciting. Well... I won't spoil it for Randall. I'll let you tell him. But. <laughs> <laughs> I just said to him, we'll have to do some happy hour. And he's like, oh, I'm in Seattle. It's like, we'll drink over Zoom. I don't care. I'm going to see you. <laughs> yeah, I'll in Seattle, I, I think. Yeah. Do they? I'm not pretty I sure of it. I think so. It has to, it's like a distillery and the sky just comes down and they open their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I kept you an hour. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate you uh, just giving me uh, stories and, and fantastic sci-fi for all these years to, uh, to uh, reference and to, you know, be a great viewer for your, for your work. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Yeah. It was fun talking with you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And good luck and congrats. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. God, I wish I could have had like another hour with both of them because I really wanted to discuss more of their backgrounds. I wanted to discuss Independence Day and Stargate and, you know, I feel sometimes when you ask people about older work, it's like, I mean, some people ask me about older work and I'm like, yeah, huh. like I want to talk about it, but you kind of don't because you want to focus on what you're doing now. But those movies and like Godzilla, like all these huge blockbusters that they were part of, SG-1, like I said, 
there's like so many spin-offs of that show that they have created and, and developed and directed and written. Like, it's crazy. Um, I had so many questions written down. Like, I had a column for Dean and a column for Jonathan and then about the arc and then about being show runners. So I had way too many questions. Uh, I got lost in my notes, so you hear that in there. But I think, I think it is important to know about this creative writing side of the business because it's where it all starts. It's an idea that becomes a story that becomes real to people making it and to people watching it. And um, it's just an amazing process and definitely part of this magic of working in Hollywood. So um, him telling the story of, you know, meetings and ideas coming out and then and then developing that idea is just that's creativity at its finest I mean you take something and you develop it and then you put words to it and then you know I'm on the set decorating it it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy so um, I can't thank them enough for giving me their time and congratulations on getting a second season um, I I hope to talk to Randall uh, Groves, the production designer. I didn't get him in time for this interview, but hopefully I'll, I'll get him on here at some point. He is fascinating. He is one of the nicest men, I swear, and um, just super down to earth and good guy. I hope I hope I get to work with him again in the future. So yeah. If you are not getting my emails about upcoming episodes, please subscribe at decoratingpagespodcast.com. Check out the site. I've got some informative blogs on there. And um, I have a link to the Etsy shop, the Amazon shop to see what I've purchased on other shows. Um, and that then you could purchase through Amazon. And what else I got on there? I don't know. Cool shit. I don't know. Instagram. The Instagram is doing well. I am super happy with my social media person, Hannah Hull, who has been taking over and just, I think, making it much more colorful and interesting, and bravo to her. I think she's doing a fantastic job, and it's like, it's weird, because I have to tell her, you know, what I'm watching, and how I thought, and this and that, and she just has a better way of putting it, and it's all, it's visuals. I think she's doing a fantastic job, so check out the Instagram, and she's doing some reels on there. I've been lacking on my TikTok, I know. I've barely been on TikTok, which is kind of a bummer because I really like it, but oh, I've been busy. And I start work next week. So, ugh, yeah, busy, busy. Uh, and I just had so much time off and I feel like I'm tired. <laughs> so, yeah, there's always that, I guess. Um, so I hope you got an earful. I'm Kim Wanup for Decorating Pages. <laughs>